Hello, my name is Owen, and welcome to a quick review of The Way of Kings by Brandon Sanderson, where we ask and then answer the question, is The Way of Kings great? Is it great? Now, I've got a few new subscribers to the channel recently, thanks to the, the little stream I did with Jimmy Nuts, the fantasy network himself. So for those of you that are new to the channel, let me just let, me just let you know, yes, I do always wear a suit, and yes, I do always look this good. Everyone else, shut up, okay? It's true, I always wear a suit. Always wear a suit, and you can't prove otherwise. It's impossible. But what I'm doing, uh, I, I announced something pretty crazy at the top of the month. We're going to reread all of the Stormlight books in anticipation of the new one, Wind and Truth, that's coming out this December. And um, you all called me a madman. You said it can't be done. They said a booktube channel is going to read a book. It's impossible. Can't be done. And yet, we're one-fourth of the way there. In, in the less than three weeks... We knocked out first book of the Stormlight Archive, The Way of Kings. And I had re read this book before. This was a reread. Uh, I read it. It's been many a years now. It's been quite a few years. It, it's gotten to the point it's like Stormlight. Uh, I obviously read Rhythm of War when it came out, but even that was a few years ago now. So it's gotten to the point where it's like, I know how I feel about the characters. I don't really remember the specifics of what they experience, if that makes sense. I remember how it made me feel. And that's so true about life too, right? People will remember what you say. They remember how you, how you make them feel. So just think about that next time you're, you're walking down the street, perhaps. Just good life advice for you. But The Way of Kings. Now, listen. Brandon Sanderson is clearly one of the most popular fantasy authors, popular modern fantasy, modern fantasy author of all time, perhaps. Uh, currently one of the most popular fantasy authors. Uh, and not for not for no reason either. Obviously, Stormlight's a big hit of his, but he's got a lot of other books that are very popular, Mistborn being one of them, the whole Cosmere universe. And now, if you if you watch me for any amount of time, you know I'm up and down in Brandon Sanderson. I Mistborn did get me into fantasy when I read those with the books um, uh, quite a few years ago. I loved those Mistborn books, and I really enjoyed Stormlight the first way around. I like a lot of his books. Uh, other ones, though, more recent Brandon Sanderson works, can't quite get into. Um, so we're up and we're down, but I wanted to recapture the love again, uh, just to get myself hyped up for Wind and Truth, because to be honest, I remembered how much I liked the series, but I wasn't that excited for this release, and that's a shame. So this is, this is a part way to refresh my memory in another part way to recapture the love that I did once feel. Uh, so we reread the book, and I did not forget, but I was reminded that these books are quite large. They are. They are, in fact, quite large. Uh, this book, I read the hardcover from the library, clocked in at like 1,002 pages. Um, so hats off to me for reading it. I mean, some would say no one read it better or faster than I did ever. So try to prove that. Uh, and then, like I said, I remembered obviously a lot of the broad stroke stuff, a lot of the character arc in the first book. Uh, but a lot of the details, they had escaped my memory. And I will say, um, I do think I could lock this in as a great book. I do think Way of Kings is great. And I was reminded uh, why I loved the series um, when I read it the first time. I think that Brandon Sanderson's world building and, and character work in this book is not just like broad strokes. It's good. I, it's enjoyable. I think it's very approachable. And I think like... The problem I have with a lot of fantasy books these days, and quite frankly, recently I've been having trouble getting into new series because I find myself like almost cynical reading these books where it's like, you're going to throw another continent at me, another pantheon of the gods and this magic system. And it all just gets a little bit too much, right? It's like you have to do the same mental rigmarole every time you start a new fantasy series where they throw a billion names at you you got to learn all the culture and all like the different little twists the authors put on it and honestly like i feel like a part of me is getting to the point where like maybe it's me maybe i'm just not enjoying fantasy new fantasy series the way that i used to so i was a little scared like getting back into stormlight remembering all like the the minutiae and all that stuff like would feel that same way like when i'm reading like a new book um like a new fantasy series but the way that he presents his information, it is a lot of lore, it is a lot of world building, uh, and it is a complex world, fairly complex magic system, and I don't think the approachableness is just because I was rereading either. I think that the way he writes is, he gives you the information fairly in a straightforward manner, and he lets the, the really complex world building stuff be almost unimportant, if that makes sense. He'll throw out like, 
The heralds, the heralds of old, the desolation has come upon them and they have forgotten their oath. Bro, I just started the book. Just started the book, have no idea what any of that means. And Bran Sanderson kind of says, that's okay. We're gonna follow uh, a battle next. And you just want this guy to, to protect the little kid, okay? That's where we're gonna start from there. So like every time you get the moments of like, what the heck is this guy talking about? He gets you back into a very easy to follow storyline and all of the main storylines in this book uh, Kaladin, Shallan, Dalinar. It's very, very, I, I don't want to say simple because I don't want to like reduce it. It's very easy to follow character motivations and character wants in a scene by scene basis. Uh, so it's like you get these sprinkles of like the world is large and you are lost and you're merely a speck anchored by these, by these three characters and their three storylines. Uh, so because it's paced so well as well, there's always something interesting going on, I feel like, in all these POVs. You're not getting lost in the world-building sauce. Because sometimes authors like will take extended periods of time throwing you deep into the trenches of this world. And it is doing that, but it's doing it in a way where you don't have to learn everything at once. And this might be where we get some into controversial territory, right? I think some of the weakest points of this book is where, like what I just said, it was a good thing about the book, where that's not as strong. Because uh, what he does in this book, I think the weakest portions are like the interludes. Uh, because, and this is where I feel like my reread experience actually does help me with this. So like the interludes is where Brandon Sanderson goes, gloves off, bad boys. We're throwing you into the deep end. We're going to throw this obscure concept at you. We're going to throw more characters, more magic, more hints, more foreshadowing. And it's all going to be packed in these little chapters, the characters you have no emotional attachment to. And that's where the book almost completely loses me. And these are very short chapters, like three pages, four pages. But I just think in a book that's a thousand pages, and there is a lot being thrown at you, I think this this deep, dark foreshadowing, and then a little like blurs between each chapter, which gives you a hint at the different world, and the worlds of the combining, and the Cosmere is large and very vast, and you're just, and you have to read all the books to find out. It's, this stuff is, it's not like in your face. It's very much vague, it's hinted at. But these interludes, like I don't, I, I want to see about the bridge, the bridge four. I want to see them in their runs. I want to see Dalinar fighting his schizophrenia. These interludes, they're trying to make the world feel bigger, but it just takes me out of it completely. And I think of this entire story, it's the weakest parts. And that's really the only thing I'm going to massively complain about here. Uh, because some people like the hinting, some people like the foreshadowing, they like connecting the dots, they like the puzzle of it. Me personally, that is not what I enjoy about reading a fantasy book. And I know that might sound hypocritical because I like a more complex um, uh, fantasy series. Like I love Malazan. That's a very like not, in, you're not going to give you anything. He's only going to hint at things and foreshadowing and stuff like that. It's not the same as I have to do the brain puzzle of, do you remember in that book when that guy said that thing? That's, that's going to come up this and this is that part. And Brandon Sanderson is not a type of author where like he's going to punish you for not figuring those things out, which is good. But I don't like the chapters that are clearly like, this is going to be important later. So like really think hard about that thing and like attach yourself to these characters that aren't important for now because it'll pay off later. Don't enjoy. Personally, don't enjoy that part. It needs, and, and listen, I, 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 it's like saying I don't like foreshadowing. That's not really exactly what I'm saying. Because if you if you read the book, you know what I'm talking about. Like these are very like specific niche world building chapters, and personally, having read the the rest of these books already, and obviously I haven't read the fifth book because it's not out yet. I don't found that the I haven't found that these paid off in a satisfying way, which means to me that either a they haven't paid off yet, which is like, dude, the books the books are so long, like maybe maybe don't foreshadow things. 12 years in advance, especially because it's like 5,000 pages worth of work. And if I hadn't read this book, I wouldn't have even known what you're talking about. Or it paid off in a way that me and my simpleton brain wasn't able to comprehend. And in that case, I am justified in saying that it's a waste of my time to read it because I am not smart enough to figure it out later. And I do not think that I'm like below average intelligence. I think the majority of readers, they like the big action stuff. They like the main characters. They like their storylines. But these like these small little hints, these small little world buildings just don't jive with, right? That being said, the, um, the Sezeth interludes, very, very interesting. If those could have just been him and hit a little updates in his story, that's great stuff. That's interesting stuff. And that's also foreshadowing world building stuff. 
It's the other very small chapters that that's where it loses me a little bit. And that was a long-winded explanation, but that's really the only major negative I have in this story. Because moving backwards, I mentioned all the POV characters are super strong, very easy to attach to. And that might be another controversial thing. People say that Shalon's story is boring. No one likes her. She's not funny. She's cringe. I had to not find her storyline to drag in the slightest bit. The only three storylines, I think the, I think of the three, the one that's the weakest in this book is actually down in our storyline. It's slow. It's, I, I think his flashback or his dream sequences are, for, are fairly interesting, but overall the, like the, the plane runs, like the, the, the hunt for the, the gems, the battle stuff, surprisingly that's like the least interesting part of the story because it feels very like this is going to get interesting when Dalinar figures out what's wrong with him but it's a lot of like what's wrong with me fight it what's wrong with me oh politics I'm losing my way and it's like we know because of the way the story is structured that he's not that he's right but there's a lot of especially in the first three quarters of the book it's like what's wrong with me what's my life I found that to be the most uninteresting. Uh, Shallan and Kaladin's story are very interesting in different ways. Obviously, it's not it's not disagreeable to say that Kaladin's story is much more entertaining. It's by far the best part of this entire book. I think the way that that his story builds on each other, the way the thematic um, build of his story of like learning, like obviously the flashbacks of like him and like his father, um, and honestly the flashbacks. Some of the flashbacks were weren't the most entertaining parts of the story either. But I just think like the bridge runs in those characters and like building himself up like step by step, like kind of like a video game characters of like leveling up. Like you're a lowly slave to your bridge burner to your bridge burner with training and you're gonna like adapt, overcome, build your team. That's all very, very satisfying in this book. And I think it's by far the strongest part. Uh, and like I said, what I mentioned with the themes, right? One thing I really, really like about Stormlight which I was reminded of, which I didn't think I didn't think in the front of my brain the first time I read it, is it's so refreshing how optimistic this world is and this book is really because uh, I, I I did forget some of like the major twists for some reason like Sadius's character what he does in this book I knew what I felt about him because obviously like the back of my brain I remembered what he did but I forgot the actual action so it, it came to me as a surprise again I was able to feel that oh, moment again. Obviously, Sanderson is great at like the, the, the Sander Lynch, they call it, like the climax, everything coming together, everything going to crap at once for everybody's storyline. It's great stuff. But just how optimistic this story is, where it's like the characters that do the right thing are in this book always rewarded. And that's so refreshing because a lot of books, obviously, they try to skirt the line of this grim dark, like, you know, like life's tough, life's unfair, but like. He's not afraid to say, like, if you do the right thing, if you are honorable, if you protect others, then you will get this magic power and you will win the day. And that's present throughout every single storyline, every single character. Obviously, most present with, with, with Kaladin because he's the one that's, like, actually grappling with this as a character. And I like that it's also, like, it, 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 it just builds on it, especially with Kaladin's storyline, right? Because it's, like, it's not just that, like, you protect the other. Because, like, his whole thing is, like, I I try to do the right thing. I try to protect my men. And yet I keep feeling like I'm cursed. Like, I'm a loser. I should give up. It's like, no, you should protect others. And that, like, extends to, um, like, not just your squad. How can you protect everybody so you don't, like, get the whole army killed? And then it's, like, it, it's, like, about... It just like building, it's like, it's not just about protecting your inner core. It's not just about protecting the dark guys, not just protecting it. It's like, you got to do what's right because it is right. And that means like, there are no restrictions into doing good. And that's kind of what he, he learns and slowly develops there. And with the final act of like, spoiler alert, I guess if you haven't read the book, you almost, you almost he hasn't read this book, but I'm going to spoil something anyway. When he saves Dalinar, he saves the light eyes. Uh, and, and the soldiers like that's like him like overcoming that right and, and then he, he says the words and he like sucks in the power he becomes like ultra god mode it's so it's it's first of all it's so fun to read and i've said before like sanderson is like perfect popcorn fantasy not in a degrading way it's just entertaining you want to see him pow level up you want to see him go super cyan mode and it 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 just gets a lot of payoff there. And I think it's a lot of fun, but it's optimistic, right? And 
obviously Dalinar is a character who struggles with like, his, his code and like doing what's right and he gets betrayed, right? And some fantasy books would be like, okay, and then he gets slaughtered. <laughs> get Ned Stark, idiot. Sanderson's not that type of author. He lets him get away with it. He lets him live for, live for another day. And he always does what's right in this book. And, and Kaladin learns what it means to truly do right. He's always doing good the whole time. He, he kind of keeps getting rewarded incrementally, finally commits to that ideal, and we have a happy ending for this book. And I, I just think it's refreshing to have that because sometimes I feel like authors try to be a little bit too gritty, a little bit too sad, and it's refreshing to have that every once in a while. So I did enjoy that. So overall, I, I, I think, and obviously it's too early to say without rereading all of the books, but this is definitely Sanderson's like magnum opus, right? This is his, this is the work of his. And I think Way of Kings might be one of the greatest first fantasy books in a series that I have read personally. The fact that it gets you immersed in this world, you get a taste of the magic system and how it works, uh, asks a lot of questions that are that you want answered, but also, like, it has a satisfying conclusion, right? It's not really a cliffhanger end ending. It's it's an ending that makes you ask, what's next? And not like, how is this going to resolve, right? Because this this story kind of resolves, but you want to know what's going to happen in the next book. So it, it, it invites you in. It, it gives you a nice, fun, exhilarating ride. and makes you excited. It's a great fantasy book, guys. It, it really, really is. And not just in like, oh, it's, it's, it's easy fantasy. It's fantasy for idiots. No, it's just a great book, guys. I really, really do feel that way. And and I know I, I went along right by the interludes or whatever and the and the hinting and the foreshadowing. It really just wasn't for me. But because they are so short, like I can look past those things. And maybe to my detriment, maybe when this fifth book comes out, are all the interlude lovers gonna be coming out of the woodwork saying, Oh, well, you didn't enjoy that chapter because I read the interludes deeply and reread them. If that's the case, I think it's a sign of a poor book five, perhaps. Because it's about the broad stroke stuff that we should really be focusing on as a casual reader. Uh, because I just don't have the mental capacity to be going deep in the weeds, right? And I think Sanderson, for the most part, does a great job of letting me not having to study, look up Wikipedia pages for everything. Because as much as I like a complicated fantasy, I really don't like doing homework, guys. I really don't. In this book, for the most part, I, I feel no need to do that. Uh, and just great characters overall. And, you know, it's a bit of rambling, a little bit of back and forth, a little bit all over the place. But you know what? For a book one reread of Stormlight, things are going swimmingly. And I do remember that Words of Radiance is my favorite of the four. So I can't wait to reread it with a, with a perhaps different perspective now that it's a reread, now that I've read a lot of other books in between then. Uh, but if you want to come along the journey, if you want to share your thoughts below, if you have a more concrete thing to say than what I've been talking about for 18 minutes, woo, comment down below. Be sure to like and subscribe if you like the video and you want to see more like in the future. And as always, thanks for sticking around.